Watch out, say it, dude. We gotta get this money. Rock. Watch out when we come for you. Take all of your honey. First of the month and when it's due. We gotta get this paper. Uh, thank you all you guys uh, the guys who have visited my channel uh, Dennis Mukoya TV yeah it's fantastic uh, what you've been doing as always you appreciate yeah we recently uh, uh, crossed the yeah we hit that threshold we crossed the 10,000 mark yeah if it was last year maybe I would have been uh, would have been very happy about that but uh, uh, due to the change in the monetization policy for Google, uh, the Google Ads, uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, monetization. Yeah, we, we, are, we are not able to monetize at that at that level. Despite, uh, we would, if it was at this time last year, we would have been able to do that. But all the same, we are still thankful. We are still thankful for that milestone. Uh, yeah, we thank you all the subscribers, everybody who has viewed us. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, if we would have. Uh, if, if if each and every guy would have who, would have, who has watched our video so far would have uh, sub, been our sub, sub, subscriber, perhaps uh, by now we would have made that uh, we would be able to be monitored right now. But uh, uh, we, we, can't, we can't complain about that. Yeah, so far it's been good. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, this uh, the new monetization uh, policy is quite tough on the. Uh, the small time uh, YouTube channel holders, but uh, yeah, 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 you, you know us, it's not a small channel, and sooner or later we'll get there, but uh, yeah, there's no problem about that. Uh, the main uh, grounds for making this video yeah, was to, to discuss uh, this matter of uh, uh, calling the government to, to, have, uh, to exercise some prudence in the liberalization of our local economy to safeguard uh, the local industrialization uh, we know as the government uh, uh, the government has been been too lenient uh, with the with the liberalization of all sectors of the economy to a such an extent that uh, there's no protection to our local industry local manufacturers the local economy yeah we, we, we are just pandering to the whims of the maybe our local neighbors uh, yeah and, uh, in a, in a, in a, trying to get some regional integration but Maybe to the in the, in the in the fullness of time, maybe that will, may not be the best thing. So uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, uh, it, it's an effort to call to the government uh, to call for some prudence in the liberalisation of our local economy to safeguard industrialization. Yeah, this scene has been replayed time on end. There is the story of the responsible, uh, uh, often hardworking husband. Is the head of the family, the breadwinner, and the doting father of a, quite a young family. He gets up every morning to go to work to cater for all his family's needs and wants. He toils each day with nothing else but the best interests of his fledgling clan at heart. Later in the day, he departs work, making a beeline for the local where he takes two for the road. Returning home at the tail end of each day, infernally exhausted, he is in need of nothing else other than his bath, dinner, and sleep. Even the day's news has lost consequence to him, as everything has just meshed to a bland and predictable offering of tragedies on corruption, mercury and copper compounds passed off as sugar, land grabbing by the usual masters of impunity, ineptitude by pseudo-technocrats, unnecessary deaths, kutangatanga by apprehensive political players smack in the middle of another guy's presidential term, an all-round resignation and obeisance to the gods of mediocrity. This antipathy is exacerbated by the bevy of insecure socialite wannabe busybody news anchors trying too hard to sell commodities and goods other than what they are handsomely paid to, try to convey. The family lives well, existing in a spacious multi-roomed house they owned a 62-inch HD IPTV, and each bedroom is an ensuite such that any, everyone sub, sub, subsists in their own bubble of comfort and relative privacy. They have a fully operational kitchen furnished with many amenities, some even surplus to requirements, 
Each of the children has the latest PlayStation with all the almost 7D graphics that come with it. As for the wife, she's a portly, beautiful, content-looking, modern, yet suitably subservient homemaker in her mid-30s, who seems to have all the comforts she can imagine and by the flash of the credit card can buy all that gladdens her heart. In the middle of all this opulence, the mother of the family is nonchalant and ill at ease. Can anyone hazard a guess why? Not even me, man. None. You're not alone. Not even the husband can understand what is wrong with this woman. Spoiler alert to all the single ladies uh, reading this post. Uh, the, the, there's this term, woman. The technical term used to describe you in the niceties like uh, sweetie, honey. Uh, those ones uh, stop being used uh, as soon uh, as the, the, the guy puts the ring on it. And uh, maybe carbon copies of uh, both your chromosomes have been issued, uh, if you get my drift. To him, she now seems an insatiable ogre and the epitome of owning your own bottomless pit. Questions like, can't this woman understand how much effort I expend to afford her? All the luxury she now enjoys become the staple. But I personally feel a tinge of dismay for this lady. Not because she forgot to ask her battle-hardened mother for both the hard copy and PDF of the husband's manual before delving into marriage. Hell no. Also, not because I'm naturally inclined to both compassion and comprehension, but because as marriage counselors will tell you, there is more to marriage than the basic providence and all the scheduled vacation to Dubai and Zanzibar. It moreover requires one to be acutely aware and eternally strive to cater for the needs of each other and simply be emotionally available for the other partner. The lady simply hangs on to whatever she has in appreciation of the fact that she now enjoys the prestige and luxury of a perpetually catered for fuel guzzler of a Range Rover Sport more than she could ever persevere the squalor and indignity that comes with riding a matatu. Like many roads in this country currently, I think I've taken a cost diversion, but it's a worthy one. The lords of the economy in this country, Kenya, have contrived to have free market laissez-faire economy. To them, capitalism is the way to go, and nothing tastes sweeter than the acquiescence of the full dividends of your investments. After all, who wouldn't want to get full value for money, to spend less and earn more, to make super profits out of any business endeavor he puts his mind and hands to? In 2003, when the NAC administration took over, we all know the situation many industries and factories were in. Many years of open malevolence in the form of kleptocracy, tribalism, favoritism, nepotism, and the appointment of cronies as company directors for political expediency, executed in the previous regime, had bred ineptitude and impunity, which had run down most government corporations and state-run entities hmm, had run to ruin, if not insolvency. With accountability being the tapestry of our sewerage system, the economy was in a rut and devoid of a leader with not just the know-how, but the required gravitas to get it out. A national paradigm shift was required as a matter of grave national urgency. Then wheeled in the Kibaki-led government. And because he was an economist, an economics virtuoso, everyone was imbued by the audacity of hope that he would all but radiate from his regime. And a good job he did, other than the metribolism and selective forgetfulness on the idiosyncrasies of implementing the Memorandum of Understanding with his political partners and maybe former nemesis, he still fared admirably. That opinion is, of course, subjective. The, the government of Kenya has had many missteps in its running and use of executive authority. Few have been ignominiously grievous as the allowing for the capitulation of our local industries. In the developed world, creators, builders, manufacturers, innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, solutions architects, and free thinkers have been given freedom to be all they can be and build all these solutions. 
all the solutions to the problems that the nations have. This is because these nations understand the importance of free enterprise. With industrialization, you will keep most of the polity gainfully engaged and reduce the proclivity for political instability. Besides, the world is ready to pay a premium to the man or woman that creates utility in a commodity or service with an aim to satisfy human needs and wants and solve many problems and puzzles of human life. There will always be a market for manufactured goods. The mechanics of starting an industry or any business dictate that after all the preliminaries, the business will have to take some time to hire staff who will work their socks off, marketing to help attract new customers. They will market share, eventually break even. Then afterwards, the import of many years of sound and relevant management will have to be imparted to grow and aggressively expand the enterprise so as to make more profit and develop a worthwhile venture. An important consideration about business is that you have the option but to grow. You have no other option but just to grow and scale up distribution channels. If not, mounting recurrent expenditure, taxation, legal costs will eventually gobble up your profit margins and ultimately run you out of business no matter how noble a person you are, your level of integrity notwithstanding. Unfortunately for Kenyan farms, they are not usually accorded the same privilege and financial support to go through the entire process of development. Their products are subjected to unfair competition from goods originating in other nations in absolute disregard of our cost of productions among other considerations. Due to industrial costs being higher in Kenya, thanks to our cartel-like culture of business and the man-eat-man economics, our goods are not as competitively priced as those from other climes, more so the developed world. The Kenyan economy is majorly supported by agriculture and the small and medium enterprises that dot the landscape. These are for most part not the greatly capitalized as the big state-run organizations, and as such, any small market shock will hit to the core of this of, of to the core of the being and crumble them like a house of cards. A time existed when there was a clothing manufacturing industry in Kenya, the Kikomi Cotton Factory. They used to produce reasonable quality items of clothing. I hear that very few people had qualms about the quality of vestments produced locally and we even exported to our neighbors. Then thanks to some ill-advised policy change, in came the second-hand clothing industry. These are used garments from North America and Western Europe, which made an influx into our local market. Because of their lower price point and the slightly more advanced technology used to produce the same, our locally produced fabrics could no longer pass master against the new competitors. The durability and wider range of fashion options effectively dealt our clothing industry a killer blow and revival became an exercise in futility. By the way, who would even have concerned themselves with trying to revive this industry when most likely kickbacks had been paid to our rulers to push through this expropriationary policy? The story is the same all over, for tea, paper, pyrethrum, coffee, sugar, and even the cashew nuts industry, a legacy of bringing down local investment just to satisfy the interest of a few foreign investors and cheaper goods from other regional economic competitors. In the mid-70s, Western Kenya and Nyanza regions were the hotbed of sugar production. This incursion was brought about by the hot and humid climate that was deemed suitable for cane growing. Though most companies were run by the departing settlers, sound market practices still prevailed. They came, then came the transition such that the local hands took reign of these industries and all hell broke loose. Each and every one of these new managing directors and CEOs, for most part, got into the seat and virtually saw dollar signs in their eyes. Out of nowhere, they appeared an onerous opportunity for
for personal aggrandizement and changing of their personal circumstances. Palatial rural and urban homes came up at a premium all over and the dream to marry that ever elusive next wife was the principal motivation in this administrator's mind. Personal growth and not best interests of the organizations became their primal aim. They started underpaying and coercing, even threatening the producers of raw materials, thinking in their demented comportment that the more they squeezed out of the smallholder farmers, the more benefit they would accrue for themselves. This injurious course of events has resulted in the disenfranchisement of farmers, some of whom had to sacrifice arable land that would have supported subsistence farming so that they so that they now have to beg for foodstuffs just to gain that extra yard of earth to grow cane. As for all levels of perversion, the situation has roiled further by political willadillas who found a new opium to intoxicate their impoverished and disillusioned electorate with. Elect me and I will deliver heaven and earth and deal a, kill, a, death, a, a death nail to the managerial malfeasance affecting these factories. Some even went to sugar millers administrators and very callously pitched for facilitation fees, claiming that they had the ability to pull strings to avail government bailout funds for the struggling millers. As with many politicians, fact is more greatly constrained in comparison with fiction. When they get elected, they immure themselves in the anonymity of life in some posh suburb, suburb in the capital, never to be heard of again for the next five years. For them, the dish called the truth has to be overseasoned with fables, the seasoning called propaganda. They may not be so austere with spending, but are ruthlessly economical with the truth. But one economist who was not known to suffer fools was our very own former president, Mwai Kibaki. Once, as he addressed a rally in the Greater Mumias area, a horde appeared shouting for the revival of MOKO, which is an acronym for the Mumias Outgrowers Company. The bemused head of state, who had no doubt cared little for the organization, in a witty retort told the hecklers to go and grow cassavas and arrowroots if they are causing all this ruckus because of sugarcane. He mistook Moko for the Kiswahili word for cassava, Mihogo. Hearsay aside, the aforementioned rascals have worked in concert for eons to bring down a local factory, many a local factory. The, the narrative is the same all over. In the end, a limitless tolerant of recurrent expenditure, salaries, dissatisfied producers, and paid suppliers and the consequent litigation has crumbled many an industry. In an effort to appear altruistic and charismatic, the government avails bailout funds, but without the right framework for the uptake of the same, and all in vain. Smoke billows in these industries for two weeks. Then what? Shut down. Yes, again, the usual excuse is routine maintenance. But how many times will the same factory be in routine maintenance in a three-month period? Then the popularly elected government decides that it's no longer feasible to run local industry in a manner likely to produce competitive goods and decides to pander to the whims of regional integration and allows for the importation of duty-free sugar. Wow. Shifting to the remedial lane, just like corruption, narrow-minded policy and the impact of benefiting just a few people at the expense of greater good. Imagine all the jobs that would have been availed to highly skilled professionals continually being churned out of our universities, year in, year out. Engineers, accountants, procurement officials, storekeepers, lawyers would all have found a worthwhile sustenance if all these collapsed farms had stayed open, I am not roundly condemning foreign investment. Unfettered flow of capital investment into the nation can only be good for us in the long term. Building economics of scale and strengthening efficiencies of erstwhile and productive ventures. 
However, this effort should be tempered with other measures to have a favorable mix. The first action is affirmative action, also called protectionism. In other nations, there are incentives and an all-out closing of ranks to protect local industries and their respective market segments. This has been effectively employed by nations like Brazil. Yes, our sugar-producing competitors, whose legacy we may never match. And it works like a charm. If recent stories of our, lo our own local sugar barons importing the same to be further processed are to be believed, our efforts should be constrained to but inclusive of fair tariffs, equitable taxation, subsidies for the local producers of our goods, heavy import duty imposition on similar goods procured externally and setting up of a quota system for the local produce vis-a-vis -vis foreign imports. In my time in business, I've been forced to ponder this conundrum well, of course, teaming in a Kenya Revenue Authority inquiries Q. What is this obsession with double taxation? Is our Revenue Authority so intellectually constrained as to think that they can ameliorate the national coffers by simply taxing producers twice? This is the kind of balladash that we as a citizenry have to stand up in force and ruthlessly castigate as it's drowning many industries in a mire of unnecessary expense. Revive local manufacturing as a matter of urgency. With the situation we have precipitated currently, we have even occasioned an imbalance of trade where we import more than the value we reciprocate to our trading partners. That balance of trade can only be restituted by a renaissance in local manufacturing. Many years in the doldrums have built us as nothing more than laborers for the sake of consumption while regenerating nothing. As mentioned previously, none of our foreign partners will find the imperative to take us seriously when there is nothing of value they can get from us. All the while we import as much as bottled drinking water. Third one, export compensation should not be viewed as a favor to a few well-heeled operators, but be proportionately paid out to our local exporters and as promptly as has in the past been paid to some scummy connivers who exported air in a mega scandal. This time round, due diligence is advised. Forthright leadership and policy change. My message to the current Cabinet Secretary for Industrialization Adam Mohammed, beware of that entity known as the deep state. In their attempt to influence government policy, they will draw it towards a direction that favors the sweet spot between protection of local economy and in the same vein fostering external investment. Theirs is the same tired incantation. It is our time to eat. It is only a multi-level approach that will be deemed satisfactory to all the players in the field and board well for our future prospects. Why on earth do we bang our chests proclaiming sovereignty when given relevant and progressive advice by donor community, but cannot exercise the same sovereignty to protect our own enterprises? Magnanimity in the pursuit of broad-based approach will consequently be a better bet for all of us. But who am I to say? Next one, solidarity in the same struggle. When is our, where is our unity and solidarity when we need it the most? For instance, when a gentleman growing tea in a place like Kericho sees unfair practices collapsing a coffee cooperative in Muranga, he relaxes, often deluding himself that the same problem cannot befall him. Even after all, he smiles away and in his respective organization is thriving and cannot meet the same fate. What he does not understand is that one hole drilled on one side of a raft will eventually sink the entire contraption. Matter of factly, merchants of malice never rest and like a hydra will extend their tentacles to the extent and strangle 
all institutions where they sent blood of profitability. Then for the last one, innovate to reduce costs. Blame should just, just be a portion to the government. Even the entrepreneur community have the responsibility to innovate, to increase the efficiency of their conveyor belts of production so as to produce cheaper goods that will be more competitive in the free market, which we cannot wish away. If not, forever being held in derision by other nations will become our portion. Consumerism has never been and will never be rewarded by, by anybody, but quite rightly frowned upon and held to ridicule. As the leader and proponent for minimalist living, Mahatma Gandhi once quipped, there is enough in this world for everybody's need, but not enough for one man's greed. We should stop allowing ourselves the misfortune of suffering the unsubstantiated suckers, that is the regime of inadequate, insular and utterly abominable leaders who collapse our industries for parochial gain, we no doubt deserve better. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's all I wanted to give you for today. Yeah, that's all I wanted to give you today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, even though, I, I, I'm just ho hoping that the, go the, the government will take, will, will take whatever advice that I've been given seriously. Uh, of course, they can decide to, to, to throw away our advice because they have uh, the PS in charge of these matters. So maybe just some ordinary guy in the street telling them, uh, try to give them some advice. They can say they, they can decide not to take that, but yeah, it's, uh, the ball is in their court. Yeah. And uh, again, thank you all for allowing us to reach uh, 10,000 views. Yeah, God bless you.